Thank you, Karen. Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to being um, inspired and enlightened and more determined uh, myself. But it's, it's, it's a joy to be here. Thank you very much to the Singapore uh, International Foundation for the uh, invitation. And I'm particularly looking forward to the, the panel uh, discussion with, with Howard and Simon and Karen, and, and also opening it out to everyone uh, in the room. But I was asked to uh, just say a little bit about some of the work that we're currently uh, doing, which I will do. I, I, I find it rather difficult because I was asked to talk about a project uh, which is very much in formation uh, for us. Um, the book, uh, which I'll talk very uh, uh, about in a moment, uh, only went into the publisher yesterday. Um, I wrote the last uh, chapter uh, yesterday here in Singapore. And it doesn't come out until April. So I'm, I'm telling you a, a little bit about some things that um, uh, 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 perhaps uh, 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 now let me see if this works. It works. So, um, I've been asked to talk uh, about um, uh, this theme of the zero noughts. I'll explain uh, why we've uh, picked this particular uh, language uh, in a moment. But the idea is that um, in this field of sustainability, which I've been involved in for uh, a couple of decades now, um, there's a new set of people popping up, but not many of them as yet. But I think that they're immensely exciting, and I think their work is uh, very important uh, indeed. And in terms of what I'll be talking about this morning, the, the, these are the, uh, the headings. Uh, I'll say a few words uh, by way of uh, introduction, who we are, what we do, why we do it. Um, I think we're at one of these moments where, in different parts of the world, people are waking up to the fact that this is no longer about simply incremental change. We've got to change uh, the system and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and the implications for uh, capitalism as it moves deeper into the uh, 21st century. I'll talk about a study that um, we published last week um, uh, in London and in Toronto. Uh, so this, in a way, uh, 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 will count as the uh, Singapore launch. It's called the Future Quotient, and the uh, copies are uh, outside. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, that. Uh, and some of the dimensions of change that go with that, and then, finally, um, the zero agenda. And I'll say some words uh, early on and why we think the race to zero is now uh, so important. So a few words of uh, introduction. So uh, it, it, a moment ago, a number of us were just uh, sharing stories on what actually got us into this uh, sort of space in the first place. And it, it, it's a bit of a horror, but uh, it's 50 years since I uh, found myself uh, backing in almost accidentally into the environmental uh, space uh, at age 11 and raising funds for the uh, World Wildlife Fund in its first year. Uh, I, I now sit on the Council of Ambassadors of WWF, but I'm mainly not working with NGOs. I'm mainly working with business, and since 1978 I've set up three uh, companies, uh, Environmental Data Services, Sustainability, and most recently Volance. They all have a social purpose or a social uh, mission, but they've all been, uh, at least notionally, for profit, not always uh, profitable. Um, I sit on too many boards or advisory boards, um, and I agreed to sit on another one yesterday, so um, I must get better at saying no. But they range from very large companies uh, like Nestle uh, through uh, financial groups like venture capital funds or uh, F&C as foreign, what used to be Foreign and Commonwealth is a very big investment. Um, organization. I'll talk a little bit about the Ecological Sequestration Trust, which is there as EST. IIRC is the uh, International Integrated Reporting Committee, which I'm part of, which is one of these uh, new organizations that's trying to drive sustainability reporting into the mainstream uh, of accounting and financial practice. And then, as I say, I'll talk a little bit about the um, uh, the book. Uh, Verge, just I'm aware I'm, I'm, I'm um, jumping over that. That was the one I agreed to uh, uh, join yesterday. It's based in the United States, but, but increasingly global. And what it's looking at is the overlap between uh, the building industries, the transport industries, the energy industries, and information technology. So these sort of uh, very interesting uh, zones of overlap between different sectors of our uh, global economy. I'm hoping that this will 
wake up. Yes. Uh, s some of you may have heard of the triple bottom line. Uh, we've been associated with that since 1994. Uh, the simple way of explaining that to the wider world was uh, people, planet, and profit. I still think that that concept has utility or usefulness. Um, but often I find it uh, is a little bit misleading. People tend to th uh, do an economic piece, a social piece, an environmental piece. Increasingly, what we need to see in the world is a blending of all of that. So when I think about sustainability, these are some of the definitions uh, that come to mind. I won't read them out. And the slides would be, will be available to anyone who wants them uh, afterwards. So uh, don't scribble uh, too manically. Um, but for me, the, the, the final uh, definition there is, is, is the critical one. It, it, it is, uh, I had thought until about a week ago that this world of ours was moving towards a global population of uh, about 10 billion people plus uh, a, a, a little bit. Uh, and as you know, later this month, uh, probably within a day or two, we hit the 7 billion uh, figure. But the United Nations, as many of you will have read uh, this week, are launching a study which concludes that instead of stopping at 10 billion people, the world seems to be headed by 2100 uh, towards a population uh, of 15 billion. I find that absolute, uh, even 10 billion frightens the wits out of me. Um, and I think in a way that just hopefully underscores the importance of what we'll be talking about uh, today. And then just finally, by, by, by way of introduction, um, Volans, I was just uh, asked by Simon what the word m means. And, and the word comes from the Latin. Uh, I, I gave up Latin when I was 14. I couldn't understand it. But, but I still find it useful sometimes. Um, and volans means flying. So if you think about the flying fish, that's Pisces volans. So it's anything that jumps but flies. And I feel that w when we went looking for a name for the new organization, we were looking for a name that, that, that represented this need for all, all of us, all of our organizations, to jump to a very different level in what we do. Some of the, uh, the clients and partners we work with are, are briefly uh, introduced there. And then just uh, this morning, I was, I was um, uh, emailing back and forth. Uh, he's in the United States with the guy in the orange suit at the top there. The guy, his name is Jerry Linninger, one of these rare people who was both an astronaut uh, and a cosmonaut. He was on the Mir space station, which you see there, the Russian or Soviet uh, space station, uh, for five months did 40 million miles uh, on that thing. Uh, you can see it's in a pretty ragged state. It's been hit by a number of meteorites. Some of the solar arrays are quite badly damaged. But it actually caught fire at one point, and they had something like 14 minutes where the, thing, the, the, the place was absolutely full of smoke. Uh, they almost died. Many of those people who came back from space came back with a very much transformed way of thinking about the world. Many of them came back quite religious. Jerry didn't. He, 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 is, um, he came back feeling water was the defining uh, priority. Now, I don't need to say that uh, in Singapore. This is one of the issues that you've ma managed uh, fairly energetically and effectively over quite some uh, years. And then uh, it, at, at the, the second photograph, there is Bunker Roy of Barefoot College uh, in India. Just the, 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 these are both members of our 12-person uh, advisory board, and it just it shows the spectrum of different people who are now, I think, involved uh, in this agenda of ours. And let me just talk a little bit about uh, the need for system change. And uh, a, a number of you will have seen, because I've spoken a number of times in Singapore uh, before, this uh, diagram. It's evolved a little bit since I uh, used it earlier this year uh, uh, here. Um, it, it plots four waves to date of societal pressure, largely in the developed world, although there are echo uh, waves in other parts uh, of the world. And what an extraordinary world, uh, what an extraordinary year this has already uh, been. Some of, some of the events of this year uh, are listed, but think about Bangkok uh, at the moment. Think about all of these extraordinary things that are happening uh, this year of ours. And I think in, in a way we'll look back in a few years, at 2011, in exactly the same way that we look back at, for example, uh, 1989 or 1968 in different parts of the uh, world. One of these sort of tipping points, defining moments in our uh, collective history. And it, it, it's not at all clear to me where uh, we're headed, um, except that it's not going to get any easier. And if I think about my own part of the world, and I think about the Eurozone uh, problems, 
I think we're in for a pretty rough ride uh, in Europe. I think North America, uh, particularly the United States, are uh, as well. And I increasingly feel that in some ways, parts of the world are moving into not just a great recession, great reset, some people could describe it as, but something very much like a, 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 a depression. Now, I don't welcome that because of all of the social implications, the political implications, and so on. But I think for sustainability, it's essential. It's essential that we uh, destroy some of the parts of the economy that we've inherited from the 19th and 20th uh, century. And this process, I think, uh, is part of that. Um, and, and, and in terms of the, 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 the defining moments, uh, shown here is a front cover of uh, Fortune magazine showing uh, Lee Scott, who at the time was the CEO of Walmart, uh, when Hurricane Katrina knocked out something like 150 of his stores overnight. And you've seen what's happened to that store uh, uh, subsequently, cascading a wave of new specifications uh, through their uh, supply chains. Quite shocking for some of the suppliers who are having to deal with all of that. And then just last week, I had to speak in the um, crypt, you know, underground uh, area of St. Paul's Cathedral in my own city of London. And outside, camped all around, protesting uh, about the London Stock Exchange, were people who were basically picked up from the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement. Uh, I talked to quite a number of those young people afterwards, and there was a real sense of both anger and determination uh, building, which I find in many ways quite exciting, because I think you know, young people, we've tended to say, you know, are, are too passive uh, in some ways. You know, th th these huge challenges are building up. We've not heard the, uh, the, the, the youthful voices on this. Well, we're beginning to, and it's not going to be comfortable, and I don't think it's going to happen. It's, it, it's going to end uh, any time soon, and we've got to work uh, with younger generations much more proactively than we have uh, to date. Last week also saw the launch of the Newsweek uh, Green Rankings for uh, 2011. So this is the third round. The first one focused on the United States. The second one went international uh, for the first time, uh, as uh, this one is also international. Now, I've, I've been on the judging uh, panel for this, um, and I'm excited to see companies from Asia, for example, Tata uh, is one of them from India, that's being flagged up in, in, in these rankings now. But I published a blog on the Newsweek site that coincided with the launch of these rankings. And the point that I made is very simple, but I think is very important. I think these sorts of rankings, although they're driving um, uh, interest in, in, in big business and in, in these sorts of issues and challenges, um, are misleading. I think if we're right that the next decade is going to see profound economic shifts, many of the companies that are currently at the top of these rankings may not even exist in 10 years. They may have been bought or acquired, or they may even, in some cases, have gone uh, uh, bankrupt. And I think we should keep that sort of uh, thought at the back of our minds uh, in thinking about all of this. So in, in the earlier conversation uh, this morning, people were talking about uh, commodity prices, uh, for example. And I think I've, uh, many of you have probably played with the Rubik's cu Rubik Cube. I've never even touched one, let alone solved it. But if, if you remember, when it was first launched in the 1970s, I think, uh, people thought it was uh, basically insoluble. There wasn't a solution. And they found not only there was the one solution, but there were multiple ways of solving the problem. But the point was, it was interlinked and it was enormously complex. And I think our security issues are increasingly interlinked and increasingly complex in exactly the same uh, way. So you see energy security, you see food security, you see water security, you see climate security. I'm not going to keep going on with this, but you, you've got a systemic problem which is increasingly uh, clear, and all of these things are very much interlinked in ways that w we weren't quite as aware of uh, in the past. This was a piece of work that one of the organizations I'm involved in sustainability did with Globescan, Canadian group, a um, couple of years back, just ahead of the Copenhagen um, climate conference. And I, I, again, I won't go into any detail. This will be in the slides if you uh, uh, want it. But the point was that this was uh, a, a survey of experts in the corporate social responsibility and sustainability fields around the world. And the question was, what do you see as the really urgent challenges? And people would have imagined that climate change would have come top. Well, uh, 
perhaps underscoring Jerry's uh, priority, water came top. But if you look at the deeper message there, there's not just simply two or three critical priorities. There are 12 urgent priorities. Once again, I think we're, we're seeing evidence of a systemic uh, challenge. And in terms of um, the urgency of those challenges and the effectiveness of business in addressing those challenges, it's a complete mix. There are some areas around toxics or, or to some degree climate change where business can do a great deal if it's given the right uh, incentives and guidance. But there are a bunch of things in the top left-hand uh, quadrant there which are really problematic for individual uh, companies or even business uh, overall uh, to deal with. So again, this is a, a, a plea in a way for uh, not just uh, business uh, involvement, but the investment uh, uh, institutions and governments have crucial roles to play uh, in all of this. Now, just a few quick words around the um, future of capitalism. I don't know how many of you read last year the Accenture study for the UN uh, Global Compact. It was called A, a New Era of Sustainability. I, how many people uh, read that? A small number. Well, uh, two I saw. Willie I saw as well. So, yes. Um, uh, let me just very quickly highlight the conclusions, and they're shown here. And, and, and in some senses, if I think back to 1987, when we launched sustain sustainability, and we had to spell the word every day of the week, it's quite a relief now that you know, CEOs around the world, this was 766 CEOs, now I think they understand uh, the term. They, th you know, they th know it's important for their businesses, or at least they say it is. 88% uh, know that they've now got to drive it, as Walmart have done through their supply chains. But to me, the real killer was when I saw that bottom one. 81% of those 766 CEOs around the world think that they've already embedded sustainability in their business. And I really do not think that they're lying, but I don't think that they're uh, uh, telling us the truth either. Uh, because I think what they've embedded very often is corporate responsibility in its various forms, stakeholder engagement, reporting, whatever. They may have a chief sustainability officer or some similar uh, sort of role at the, the, the senior uh, levels within the companies but not uh, sustainability as I would understand it. And in terms of the, uh, the reputation or profiles of uh, leading multinational corporations, very interesting to see uh, Unilever, which uh, very recently uh, made these very bold announcements about uh, their strategic targets in the sustainability space. For example, by uh, 2020, uh, increasing their sustainability or sustainability sourced uh, uh, raw materials and ingredients from 10% uh, to 100%. It's an immense challenge. And as some of you will know, the top uh, management of Unilever were called in to see the government uh, in Indonesia and asked the question, are you serious about this sustainable palm oil uh, priority of yours? Are you really serious? Because if you are serious, it's going to cost you politically. And you're starting to see this sort of political games being played out in some of these spaces, which I think, you know, uh, Paul Pullman, the CEO of uh, Unilever, is, is probably uh, well prepared for, but many other companies uh, may not be. And this diagram just shows the, the tracking of, of the uh, reputations of a number of different uh, multinational uh, corporations. N no surprise to see what's happened to uh, uh, BP, but uh, qu quite a lot of uh, variation uh, there. So you see Unilever uh, having uh, sort of um, gone along the bottom for a little while, suddenly recovering with its uh, recent uh, announcements, Walmart uh, falling back a bit. But I don't think we should be distracted too much by those sorts of um, surveys and those sorts of findings. And I just want to t take you very quickly through a few slides which link to the carbon war room. Uh, many of you will have heard of uh, Richard Branson, uh, the uh, entrepreneur. Um, I'm involved in something that he's done called the Gigaton Awards. And these are awards that are given to businesses or entrepreneurs which are not simply fiddling at the edges of the system, but basically trying to develop technologies or business models or whatever, which will take gigatons of carbon uh, out of the uh, atmosphere over a period of time. I just want to put up a figure. And this is from um, the work of Tim Jackson, uh, but it's used by the Carbon War Room. And it, it basically, with that, that, that pink uh, box, says that for every dollar of uh, uh, gross domestic or national product that we produce, 
uh, we use or, or um, produce somewhere between 700 and 800 grams of carbon. Can anyone give me a number of how far we, they think we have got to come down in order to stabilize climate? Any offers? Well, I, I wouldn't have been able to guess the number. This is the number. It's inconceivable, and yet it's got to be done. And this is the context of the, the zero knot uh, proposition, which I'm about to uh, uh, go into. So something like a 130-fold reduction in the amount of carbon that our uh, economy spits out uh, globally. This piece of work, much simplified, uh, was produced a couple of years back by McKinsey, Cost Curve, and what it shows and the reason for the simplification is, 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 is um, relatively easy to grasp. If you look at the opportunities and risks in this carbon space, the green areas are those areas where today business could invest and make a return in a reasonable time scale on dealing with the carbon issue. The uh, amber uh, areas are ones where it's significantly more problematic and the red ones are uh, areas where there would be pretty fundamental uh, costs and wider implications. But it's very interesting to see uh, the balance half and half uh, there. And you might even say that one side p pay potentially pays uh, for the other. And the carbon war, and in thinking about all of this through, uh, basically says policy isn't the main issue here, although it's important. Technology, again, isn't the main uh, issue. I'm sorry, one or two of these letters seems to have uh, popped sideways in, in, in the file uh, transfer. But the real problem is capital, and capital deployed in the right way. And what the carbon room, war room are increasingly doing is looking at how you take some of the transaction costs out of the system and get much better information to uh, investors. And these are some of the areas uh, where they are increasingly uh, focus and it's just showing again the systemic uh, nature of it. Some of this is about geography, so China, India, some of this is about different uh, sectors of industry and given that I'm in Singapore and we all are, um, I'm going to just take the one marked up in red as my final slide of this sequence and look at shipping. Now there is no ship in the world that currently has uh, that form of marking uh, on it. Some of you may recognize the marking uh, as the European Commission's uh, uh, energy efficiency labeling that goes on refrigerators and dishwashers and things like that. The proposition is that uh, shipping increasingly will have to have the same uh, sort of labeling in terms of fuel uh, efficiency. If you look at sulfur dioxide and you look at the 16, 16, one six largest uh, ships in the world, their sulfur dioxide emissions are equivalent to 50 million cars. 50 million. And it's out of sight, out of mind. We're just simply not looking at that uh, uh, problem. But the carbon war room has started to uh, focus on that. And looking, again, the numbers have gone slightly peculiar in the, fu the, 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 the file transfer. My apologies uh, for that. So looking not just at um, the, the, the shippers or the ship owners, but a range of other uh, people involved uh, in that uh, sector. So now a few quick thoughts on the report that I introduced uh, a moment uh, ago, the future question. Um, these are some of the partners uh, in the process. Um, the, the idea is that many of us will have taken an IQ, uh, an intelligence quotient uh, 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 test. I can't remember how I scored. I probably didn't score terribly well. I don't like those tests and I don't do terribly well in them uh, either. There are also emotional intelligence tests and eco uh, intelligence tests, but we're proposing the future quotient. And why? Well, because in this sustainability space of ours, this is where I think we unfortunately find ourselves. And this is something that is routine in the area of innovation. There are moments where you have very rapid take-up of a new concept. In this case, it could be sustainability, it could be social uh, entrepreneurship or whatever. And then there is this moment where you face the challenge of uh, moving from the early pioneers, the visionaries and so on, um, and the early adopters into the mainstream. And that's where increasingly we, we find ourselves. And so what we're looking for is leadership that helps us bridge uh, that gap, that chasm. And one of the things that we did as part of the study was to look around the world and, and, and uh, again poll uh, experts and ask them, where in the world do they see long-term thinking and long-term action? Now this looks a rather complicated um, uh, diagram. 
but it runs the, 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 the thing to remember is the place to be is the white uh, uh, square at the top right. No one's there. Uh, so this is um, long-term long action versus uh, getting better uh, r rather than um, uh, worse and long-term thinking getting better than r rather than worse. Business and individuals score relatively highly out of the field. Um, Governments, unfortunately, and I, I would put Singapore to one side on that, uh, uh, continue to bump along uh, at the bottom. And that's, that's a, a, a problem for business as well. So one of the things that we've done in the report and on a, a linked uh, website, if you read the report, you will find a link where you can go onto a website and take uh, an elementary future quotient uh, test. And this was the first few days uh, of results uh, from that. And what it maps is how people think and how they prioritize. Are they thinking largely in the past, in the present, or into the uh, future? And you get an instantaneous uh, reading of, of um, uh, what that means, uh, and you can put it through uh, teams through it or organizations. But for us, this is only the very beginning uh, of the process. It's something we in intend to invest a good deal of time and effort over the next few years. Now, I just want to take you through these uh, dimensions of time. And I have to, th these come with a public health warning. Uh, the, the ideas for this came to me on a cycle ride uh, into uh, the office in, in, in London and some of my colleagues when they first heard the ideas thought it was complete nonsense and, and I'm now I'm pleased to say um, that they're all bought into it but you may feel that they're complete nonsense but let me work through, there are five of them and the first one basically is that in terms of the change that we need to see in the world, the change that we need to drive we've got to move towards systemic change and I've already uh, noted to that uh, noted that. So you see that in different parts of the world in different ways. Now the colors that would code these different countries in, in, in North Africa and the Middle East change almost by the day as the Arab Spring uh, processes crash through. But one of the reasons why we identify the Arab Spring as one of the, the, the pioneering initiatives uh, uh, in, in the report is because there is system change going on. It won't necessarily go in the direction we want it uh, to go, ne not necessarily even in the, in, in the right direction. Uh, but change is beginning to happen at that sort of level. I'm hoping that this will... Yes. I, in the interest of time, I might just skip over that one and go on to the, uh, the next one, which is ab about the scope of change. And if we're under pressure, um, uh, and, and in different parts of the world, people are increasingly under economic and political pressure. The temptation is always to focus down, to sort of think uh, more narrowly. And it's, it's exactly the time where we need to think uh, more broadly. We need to think wider. And one of the institutions in my own city that has been doing that to great effect uh, has been the London uh, Olympics and Paralympic uh, Games for next year. Challenging their supply chain, involving the uh, community, involving the wider public, involving athletes uh, in this whole agenda uh, around sustainability. And I think uh, doing it quite well. And another thing is we, we, we go narrow, we also go shallower. It's like, you know, when we're, 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 we're stressed, our, 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 our breathing becomes uh, shallower. And it's the same within institutions, organizations, businesses, and so on. But it's exactly the moment where we also have to think deeper, analyze uh, deeper. So um, an example there would be one of the, the social enterprises I absolutely adore is Hans Rosling's uh, Gapminder where they, they, they crunch all sorts of different fields of data and enable you to look at uh, trends around the world in the most amazingly uh, useful way. And I think it's no accident that Google uh, have now bought a significant part of what they uh, do. But another example uh, from Germany is the sportswear company Puma, who just earlier this year, you may have seen, launched their environmental uh, profit and loss uh, accounting uh, system. Uh, no one asked them to do this. No one told them to do this. They decided to do it. They, they, the, the, the question was, through Puma's operations globally, uh, what level of environmental damage are we causing? Answer, well, current costings, $130 million worth of environmental damage a year. Very interesting. Very, very interesting to see how that changes over the, 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 the years. But they've dug deep. question is, who will follow them down that uh, particular uh, track. And then in terms of ambition, again, when things get difficult, what do we do? We, we sort of lower our targets very often, at exactly the time when we should be raising uh, them. And I talked about Unilever 
uh, a moment ago. And one of the reasons why people have responded uh, to what they've been doing so warmly, so positively, is we all know we've got to raise the targets, but we don't want to do it ourselves. So we're sort of very happy to subcontract the challenge uh, to others. And then the final uh, element, the fifth uh, dimension, if you like, again, in crisis, we tend to sort of increasingly uh, draw back our timescales at exactly the m moment where we should be uh, extending them. And just again this morning, I was exchanging emails with people in San Francisco who work with a, a group called the Long Now Foundation. Some of you will have heard of them, I, uh, and those of you who haven't, I really encourage you to look at what they're doing. One of the things they're doing, and uh, the, the, um, on the right uh, of this diagram, you'll see uh, a diagram that shows um, different uh, levels of um, timescales. So, Elam, you like fashion, and other people here do as well, but that, that generally has relatively short timescales. And then we go right the way through to uh, infrastructures, governance systems, cultures, and uh, natural time systems. So how do you make people think about that differently? How many of you have heard of the clock of the long now? I hope quite a number. One? Well, in that case, I, 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 forgive me, but it, it's one of the most exciting things around the world, I think, that has been done in the sustainability space. If you think sustainability is not just about responsibility, it's about extending uh, significantly the way uh, we think about uh, time and our responsibilities over time, including intergenerational timescales. They're building a clock. They're building it now. They're building it inside a mountain uh, in the western United States, which will tell time over 10,000 years. And the idea is just to get people to think about um, uh, time in new ways. And so in, in the new book uh, uh, that I mentioned a moment ago, I've, I've used this device that the Long Now Foundation has done, which is on every year's date to just stick on a zero right up front. So you're actually, again, getting people to think about, actually, this is within a very much longer time scale than we would normally uh, be able to think about. So that's, that's, that's stretching be people, uh, actually, I think, a, a lot further than many of us will be prepared to go. But as a provocation, I think it's a very interesting one. And it links back fundamentally to values. And very interestingly, in the Globescan uh, uh, sustainability uh, results earlier this year, when they looked at why companies that were rated uh, highly in terms of their sustainability or responsibility activities, values came right at the top and actually had increased uh, over uh, recent uh, years. Final few comments, and this is where I get to the zero knots thing. And you, you'll have noticed that I've tried to slightly steer away from giving too much away on the book at this stage, because otherwise you won't read it when it comes out in April uh, of next year, hopefully. Um, but this is where I think we are. We're exactly where our species was in the late 40s, early 1950s. Uh, when, when, you know, if you were a pilot and you were in a very fast plane, you were starting to slam into something in midair and not really understanding what this thing was. And people, over time, started to call it the sound barrier. They thought it was impenetrable, but it turned out to be penetrable. But as people slammed into it, quite a number of uh, planes broke apart, quite a number of pilots uh, were killed. More or less around the same time, you may remember the four-minute mile. Again, it was physiologically felt to be impossible to run a mile fast in uh, faster time than four minutes. With, within uh, a year of Roger Bannister getting through, within, within a few fractions of uh, a, a minute less, um, 16 people had got through the four-minute mile. So the problem was in our brains, not, 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 not in the uh, wider world uh, so much. And I think that's where we are with the sustainability barrier. If you haven't read the Vision 2050 study that was produced uh, last year by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, I really do recommend it very highly. I don't think it's particularly uh, uh, a right in every respect, but this is very senior people from business, CEOs and the like from around the world, basically talking about what they think will happen over the next uh, uh, three to four decades. And it, it, it's almost like reading something Greenpeace might have uh, put out uh, a few years uh, back. So, this is what we're talking about when we talk about uh, zero noughts. I, I, I won't read uh, each of these uh, definitions. Um, very soon we'll have a, a website up where some of this stuff uh, will be up. But it comes out of, this, this study comes out of a, a growing frustration that uh, leaders, particularly in business, 
are thinking that they now understand what sustainability is and are defining it as just being a bit better, uh, you know, uh, uh, d doing good works and doing uh, uh, well by doing good, those sorts of formulations. We don't think so. We think we're at one of these moments where everything needs to change and everything will change. The question is whether we take control and manage the process, steer the process uh, or, or, or not. So again, if you want the definitions, they'll be available in the slide. But somebody who has articulated this argument for years, and I interviewed for the book just a, a, a couple of months before he died, uh, was uh, Ray Anderson of, of Interface, who talked about zero footprints. He talked about uh, that company's uh, Mission Zero. He talked about Mount Sustainability and how you uh, get to the top of it uh, over time. Um, an extraordinary man, a, an extraordinary visionary, but also not just a visionary, very practical in how he put those sorts of um, approaches into uh, practice in his own uh, company. In the book, I'm, I'm looking at areas like zero carbon, zero waste, zero toxics, but also areas like zero poverty. Uh, Muhammad Yunus, many of you will know of well, uh, has talked about putting poverty in a, a poverty museum. I mean, I can't see that any time soon, but in terms of the ambition, the level of ambition, I think that's right. And again, the numbers seem to have slightly gone wobbly on me here. Uh, my apologies for that. So the book comes out uh, next year, but in the meantime, we're trying to say, well, ahead of that, what can we do with companies to bring them together, to, f to really encourage them to think about this zero uh, agenda? So we're working with Deloitte uh, innovation in February of next year, we launch what we're calling a zero hub uh, with a range of companies uh, involved uh, in that. And then pretty much the last couple of slides. Um, a public health warning. When I think back in, in, in my career, what I laughingly call a career, um, uh, the first company I ever remember talking about zero was uh, BP. Uh, in the 1980s, and, and a number of us were invited in, and the question was from, from the CEO, um, does it make sense for a company like uh, BP to embrace zero targets around safety, around health, around these sorts of things? And we said, well, um, if it's propaganda, clearly it doesn't. It's a very dangerous thing indeed to do. But if, 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 it's, if it's a statement of ambition, a stretch target, uh, yes. But then uh, we see uh, what happened uh, in that case. And a, an even more dramatic case in some ways. Um, TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, in 2004, produced a really interesting sustainability report, and there were some zero waste targets in that report. So if you were reading it, you think, ooh, this is really quite exciting. I'm, I, I want to know more. And then they give us Fukushima. Um, so I, I'm not saying that the adoption of zero targets solves all of our problems overnight. It absolutely uh, won't. And a couple of us, again, just ahead of the uh, session, were talking about uh, the guy on the right, Peter Head, who for many years has worked with Arup. Uh, and he's somebody of my age, uh, 62, um, and he's, he's looking at his, uh, his grandchildren. He has three grandchildren. He's looking at their future and basically thinking about what he can do over the next decade of his working life and concluding that there's only one issue that he ought to be focusing on, which is carbon. Uh, he's done an immense amount of work in places like China. He's built uh, 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 green cities uh, there. He's designed cities like Dongtan in China near Shanghai. He's been involved in Mazdar in Abu Dhabi, another green uh, city. But he said, actually, that's not where the future largely lies. The future lies in countries like India and China burning more and more coal, whether we like it or not. The question is, what do you do with that carbon? And no one is actually going to take that carbon and stick it in holes in the ground. It's too expensive. And so what Peter has done uh, in this uh, new institution that he's launching called the Ecological Sequestration Trust is to develop a new a way of doing that. Basically, you capture the carbon, yes, but then you put it through algal bioreactors, and the algae uh, feed on the carbon and grow. You then crack the algae to uh, uh, release a range of different uh, commercially uh, valuable oils, and the sludges, the biomass, is then used uh, for soil uh, improvement. And you, you create uh, intensive horticulture and agricultural operations uh, around that. I find it immensely exciting, bless you. Um, I find myself acting chairman during the fundraising side. I'm really bad at fundraising, but, but, but I, this is one of these things where, and so instead of, I'm used to going for maybe 20, 10 or 20,000 uh, dollars or, at a time, and, and, and Peter's actually um, going for $10 million every time, and he's just got the first company to come in. Different game, but um, I think an important one. So this is what I just told you. Uh, I don't know whether 
I've done it clearly or co cogently, but I don't think sustainability properly defined is yet embedded in anyone's company. I think the problems, including carbon uh, 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 and, and climate change, are outrunning our capacity to deal with them. I think, yes, new forms of capitalism are emerging, but not always fast enough. I think the future quotient idea is uh, significant. Quite what we can do with it remains to be seen. But if any of you could take the time just to use the link in the report uh, and take the test, it's cumulative. Your results then uh, uh, build up alongside everyone else's. We'd immensely appreciate that. And then finally, um, it's time to join uh, uh, the race to zero. And uh, hopefully in the discussion period, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the work that we've recently been doing with companies like Nike, Adidas, uh, and Puma on that. So thank you immensely for your uh, uh, attention. And I very much look forward to the discussion period. So Karen, if I can possibly retreat back to the chairs, I will now do that. Thank you all.